My name is Joel Nagus, and I'm a pastor at City Church in Cleveland, Ohio. What you're about to see is a collaboration between the Duke Initiatives for Theology and the Arts and artists in Cleveland that are a part of City Church. Dr. Jeremy Begbie's program at Duke Divinity School has been a great source of encouragement for lots of artists as a part of our congregation. For me personally, I read Dr. Begbie's book, Resounding Truth, nearly 12 years ago, and I consider this collaboration a genuine honor. Thanks so much for being here with us, and we hope that this artful reflection serves you well. Human beings are creatures of time, and that means we all have to wait. Despite the massive speeding up of our lives over the last few decades, despite being able to get what we want sooner and sooner, we still have to wait for a baby to arrive, for a partner to appear, for an end to winter. There are some things that just won't be hurried. Indeed, this last year, many of us have had to learn that as perhaps never before. In this collection of readings, talks, images, poems and music, we join those who find themselves waiting on the first Good Friday. We find out what made them wait, what kept them waiting, and above all, who kept them waiting. We hope this will help you find solace and hope this Good Friday, especially if you're in the midst of a period of waiting that's draining you and pulling you down. We begin with the people of Israel waiting. After years of persecution and oppression, we hear a psalmist longing for God to liberate him from his enemies. And then, following words from Paul Turner, we join Mary Magdalene, who waits, watching Jesus on the cross from a distance. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken, but I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. How intertwined is love and time? At certain times they seem to work together, but in other instances they seem to be on two opposing sides. Like for example, we know we can love somebody more over time, but if it takes too long for it to show, some might suggest that it's a lack of the love that's actually inside. I don't know. Could it be our desire for our quick satisfaction? Or is it that we really just at our core want love to be displayed through visceral reactions? Oftentimes, time can make love seem so attractive, and other times the two seem inseparable and it's so hard for them to be extracted. So how does it happen? The infinite versus the finite, a measurement versus an affection, a whole page versus a section, a motive and a perception. We love love, but we want it to be quick and last forever so that we can say it stood the multiple test of time and that it only got better. But there are times when love enters into that continuum of space and time and seems to take too long to get to the other side. Then we start to question a motive, question a person. It's like time can dictate when love turns into hate based on somebody hurting. Man, this thought is all over scripture. In the Psalms we read, how long, O oh Lord, how long will you forget me? I mean, David was convinced that God was hiding his face because of how long it seemed to take God to mark David as safe. Man, this past year has really got me feeling away. I feel like David in the Psalms while I'm stuck in the cave, rocks falling, walls closing in while I'm trying to hold on to a faith, mouth closed with a mask while I'm separated from other people saying the same stuff that a psalmist would say. Like, how long, oh Lord? 
Will your people be hurting and weak? We're so divided by the ideologies we read, type, and speak. How long, oh Lord? Are you going to let racism shape our society? The sin of impartiality has got me fighting for my dignity at the expense of propriety. Can't even conform to the perfect image. Even if there's a claim for variety, handshakes not matching the smiles, I'm forced to have to love the same people who lie to me. I'm just asking you, Lord, how long does it got to be? I can question your love day after day. Time has got me second guessing you like one plus the other equals your full display. I'm using the one thing that I've ever known to measure the thing that I can never even grasp. The mysteries of God's affection is so deep that my head would explode if I dug into one kernel of something so vast. So, Lord, I have to ask, what did you do with time? Other than shape it, mold it, and create it? From the spoken cosmos all the way to the living atoms that made up Eve and Adam while they were in the garden unashamed and naked? I mean, God, you blocked them from the tree of eternal life while they were in their fallen state. And then you also gave them time because you blocked it so that they would never be away from your grace. You promised your people, God, one day it would be a day where you would send somebody to correct the timeline and realign man's heart to your ways. And then you stepped into time and revealed that love had a face and his name was Jesus. And he gave time and love every step of the way. Think about it. He gave time to the disciples, gave time to a wedding and a well, gave time to the lame, even gave time to a lifeless corpse that started to smell. He walked 33 years in the time that he created to die on a cross by people that he came to save. As they mocked and laughed, exposing that they are really just us. Our hearts are so radically depraved. Jesus' sacrifice will radiate through all of time and through eternity's past. And as the ground shook and the veil tore, because that was God breaking time in half. B.C. to A.D. One covenant made to two. One God. One cross. Broken timeline made new. God, your love entered time and broke it. And you even reverse time for a resurrection that can never be undone to give time for the final time to rescue your daughters and your sons. Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 to 56. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When a centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. The Word of God. God of patience and love, you never tire of waiting for us when we wander far away. Help us to wait for you in patience, and in waiting, learn to love again. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Another Mary waits as Jesus dies, this time at the foot of the cross. Jesus' own mother. Her agony is extreme, almost unimaginable. 
But next to her stands an unnamed follower of Jesus, the one John's Gospel calls the Beloved Disciple. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Stations number four, Jesus meets his mother. This darker path into the heart of pain was also hers, whose love enfolded him in flesh and wove him in her womb. Again, the sword is piercing. She who cradled him and gentled and protected her young son must stand and watch the cruelty that mars her maiden making. Waves of pain that stun and sicken pass across his face and hers as their eyes meet. Now she enfolds the world he loves in prayer. The mothers of the disappeared who know her pain. All bodies bowed and curled in desperation on this road of tears all the grief stricken in their last despair are folded in the mantle of her prayer. Also among this motley crowd at the cross is the Pharisee, Nicodemus. He's highly educated, scholarly, well versed in the Jewish law. A year or two ago, he met secretly with Jesus, quizzing him about his own teaching. But now all that doesn't seem to matter so much. All that matters now is being here with Jesus, waiting for him to die and be buried in the proper way. The composer Schubert wrote his greatest string quintet when he knew he had only months to live. Everything is concentrated, pared down. It's as if he's realized a whole lot of things he used to think mattered don't matter so much now. And if ever there were a piece that teaches us how to wait, that makes us feel it's worth waiting, then this is it. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Thank 
I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. What keeps them there? Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, the beloved disciples, Nicodemus, this little family of mourners 
At most crucifixions, the victim dies alone. No one wants to be associated with a naked, publicly shamed criminal. But these folk, they stay and wait. They seem convinced there's more to this Jesus than they can see now. More to come. What keeps them there? Well, on one level, the answer is fairly obvious. Love keeps them there. They can't simply walk away from the one who's meant so much to them. Mary Magdalene, how can she forget she was once demon-possessed, enveloped in a terrible darkness, and that this Jesus liberated her into a world of dazzling light? How could she just blank all that out and just leave him to die? Mary, the mother of Jesus, how could she abandon her own beloved son, flesh of her flesh, the one she bore and fed and raised. And the beloved disciple, how could he forget the strange attraction he and the other disciples felt for this Jesus as he healed the sick and raised the dead and fired them with a hope they never knew they could have? Was all that a delusion? And Nicodemus, well, maybe it's not quite full-blown love, but from the start, he was captivated by Jesus. He defended him at his trial. And now it seems he won't let him die unrecognized, unacknowledged, without the dignity of a decent burial. It's love, or something very close to it, that keeps him there. And what keeps us staring at the cross, taking time out this week, putting life on pause, stopping to keep silence this Friday, and wait. What makes us do that if not devotion to the one who hangs there? Love keeps us here. But of course this love is often fragile and fickle and quickly fades. Now at a much deeper level it's another kind of love that holds them there. Eternal love the love that never fades, the love of God. Like the bass line in that Schubert quintet, unwavering, reliable, unyielding love. For in this death, with all its waiting, God is performing his ultimate act of love, his ultimate victory over everything that threatens to defeat us. This is how God lifts us out of the slimy pit, to echo the psalm, out of the mud and mire and onto a solid rock to give us a firm place to stand. And this can't be rushed through or rushed over. As we continue to ponder the sense of waiting, let us move into a time of silence. Feel free to use this time to contemplate or to pray.
virtually everything in our culture presses us to think it's not worth the wait. There's no point in waiting on some God to sort things out. The world is ours to fix and ours alone. But the wiser among us, the Mary Magdalene's, the Nicodemuses, the Marys and beloved disciples of this world, they know that there are myriad things that can't be fixed right now, that can't and won't be fixed in an instant. They know that here in the events of Good Friday, and even in our waiting, an unquenchable love is at work, turning our lives around and promising us there's more to come. We hear now one final song, but before that, a prayer, the collect for Good Friday. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the darkness, can you hear us? When the night comes, are we alone? Have you forgotten all of your children?
be our strength, be our shelter replace our song in the night. Oh God, be our song in the night when the Be our strength, be our shape.